joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us Good morning, and welcome to the Rivers Online Worship Experience. Uh, My name is Dean Ward, and I serve as the lead pastor of the River Church, and I am so grateful that you have chosen to join in with us here this morning. Uh, We are in the middle of our Christmas series, uh, just simply called With Us. 
And last week, we spent quite a bit of time, okay, the whole sermon, and it was longer than I thought it would be, I was told, looking at what it looks like that Jesus, as Emmanuel, God with us, is with us in the valley. And that was a powerful experience online and in person Sunday, uh, preaching that. And just want to encourage you, if you are struggling with the uh, seasonal effectiveness disorder, if you are struggling with uh, just being in a dark place right now, I want to invite you to go and watch last week's sermon. Uh, Today's going to have a little bit different flavor to it uh, because we are going to look at uh, with us, God with us, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us in the every day. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I like it when things are good, and I like it when I have those moments of intimacy and closeness uh, with God, either through worship or other ways he answers a prayer or comes through for me in a desperate situation. Uh, There are many times in many ways I experience God's provision, God's presence, God's love in palpable ways that uh, I'm so grateful for. But do you know what percentage of my life those times consist of? Maybe like 1.1 half of one millionth percent. No, I mean, I don't even know if that's a mathematical number. Uh, but it's, it's, not, it's not where we're called to live. We are called and invited to experience Emmanuel, God with us, in the everyday, in the mundane moments, in the calm, in the chaos, in the morning when we wake up with messed up hair and stinky breath. Okay, I only qualify for one of those. Uh, But we can experience God in every moment of every day. And I fear for those of us who follow Christ that live for those spectacular moments of God's presence because we miss His presence and the power of His presence every day now uh, we're filming today Uh, my uh, matt films me and he likes it when we have a colorful background so uh, i thought wow this yellow uh, steel or orange colored bookcase is rather colorful and then this nativity set uh, this is precious Uh, this is homemade Uh, i it's so detailed so fantastic and I wanted to film with that as well. So um, what does it look like uh, God with us, Christ, Emmanuel, with us in the everyday? Well, I want to spend just a little time uh, looking at the theology of this, first of all. Um, the, the, the scriptures that anchor us in this theological truth and reality. Um, the anchor verse for our whole series is Matthew 1 23. In the New Living Translation it says, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Well, I, I want to just share with you why this is so groundbreaking because today in our culture we may not think that much about it but uh, back in the day when God revealed himself to Moses he was in the burning bush and the bush did not get consumed he was up in the mountain and Moses was in God's presence and and it changed his appearance and countenance God was always out there Uh, God resided in the temple behind the curtain of the holy and of holies where the ark of the covenant was placed. God's presence was there. But there's a movement here. 
there's a movement from the temple to the manger. And that's what this verse is celebrating. This is God with us. And then from the manger into our lives. Uh, John chapter 1, verses 1, 2, and 14 give us a better understanding of God with us. Verse 1 begins, In the beginning was the Word, referring to Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And verse 14, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now there's this great, uh, there's this great phrase in that passage I just read. It said, he made his dwelling among us. Literally, in the Greek language that that was written, it literally says that God tabernacled among us. Well, tabernacled is not going to find itself on the uh, new top 10 new words of the year, uh, but tabernacle is not even a verb, but here it's used as a verb, meaning they knew that God's presence was in the tabernacle and John is saying, now God, he is tabernacling with us. This is groundbreaking. The presence of God moves from the mountain with Moses. It shows up as the pillar of fire in the uh, wilderness at night to keep them warm. It shows up as the cloud during the day in the wilderness when the Israelites are wandering around. For those of you in western Pennsylvania that don't like the cloudy, overcast days, I want to invite you to just imagine you're an Israelite in the desert, and that's an expression of God's presence and love. Okay, maybe that's a stretch for you, but that's how I see it, and I love the overcast days. The tabernacle, the temple, now the manger among us. Bethlehem is God with us. The cross is God for us. And Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit arrives, is God in us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 in the New Living Translation says, Christ is the visible image of of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. The Father is for us. Jesus is with us. And the Spirit is in us. The last scripture I want to just uh, mention at this part is Colossians 2 verse 9. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So that's some of the theology. That's some of the scripture of the incarnation, God with us. But if that's real, if that's true, it certainly has implications for us. Also known as, what does that mean for me? If that's true, if God is with us, through Jesus, what does that mean for me? God in the flesh, God with flesh on is a big deal. So we have to work through the implication of God with flesh. The Gospels, uh, you see the disciples wrestling with kind of like, who is this guy? You know, they said even the storm, even the weather obeys him. Who is is this what is the natural response to god with flesh on well first of all we we, we see like disbelief <laughs> like the disciples their heads are spinning they can't quite wrap their minds around it but when it starts to settle in we see fear showing up 
they're terrified or a holy reverence. They, they're, they're like, wait, this God, he is now with us. He's not just in the temple. He's with us. Uh, you could also understand this implication especially for them they were saying alas victory Uh, we're gonna win now we're gonna triumph over the romans Uh, god is on our side we are going to win let's go kick some something um you know let let's go win let's go take over I see this today in kind of a misplaced pride, like, well, I'm on the winning team, therefore I post before I think, because I'm right, I'm on the winning side, I'm right and everyone else is wrong. Well, these are the, some of the kind of knee-jerk reactions to this truth, but, but let's take a moment and look at the real implications of the incarnation jesus being god with us you ready first of all we see that god again puts his approval on creation in creation when he created in genesis 1 1 it said at the end of the day he saw that it was good and now through christ his incarnation becoming God with us. This is God again affirming creation. Uh, There's an earthiness to it, a grittiness to it. God gets in the mess. He comes and dwells among us and we are a mess if you haven't noticed. The created human flesh is good the battle of the gnostics uh you know was that oh all flesh is evil everything that you can touch is evil it's only the spiritual matters and we see in this that god wins the battle over the gnostics through jesus christ this is what separates jesus from the new age stuff this is not the Christ consciousness, or simply some spiritual idea or reality out there. Jesus in flesh and blood. Second thing that we notice, the implication that changes things for us is that Jesus elevates the ordinary. Who does the announcement of Christ's birth who, who does that announcement come to? Does it go to the king? Does it go to Caesar? Does it go to the most powerful people in the world? No, it, it goes into the normal, everyday shepherds. Jesus elevates the ordinary. And this is so important when it comes to Christ being with us in the everyday because he honors the ordinary. His presence is available to us and our awareness of his presence with us in the ordinary rhythms and motions of our daily routine. Never take those for granted. Never take your mind off the reality that Jesus is with me in the middle of my workday. Jesus is worth with me in my stress. I notice so many churches, uh, they want to become the most important thing in their parishioners' lives. Uh, they want their church to center, be the center of everything in their lives. They want their parishioners, all of their activities, all of their free time, all of their spare time to be wrapped up in the church and church activities. Man, that's not how I view the church. I view my job as the pastor of the river is to get you as close to the presence of God in your life so that you take him with you everywhere you go. And you are the church outside the walls of the church. Yes, I want you to worship with us during the weekend. I want you to come to midweek uh, small groups with us. I want you to serve with us. But I want 
the center of your life to be Jesus Christ and your relationship with him and how through that relationship you can be a blessing and serve and help and point others to Christ. Jesus elevates the ordinary. The gospel accounts are full of these interactions. All the time, Jesus is interacting with ordinary people. Another thing that this illustrates the implication of Christ with us is that it, it says loud and clearly that humans are the crown jewel and most valued of his creation. God sent Jesus to us. He didn't send Jesus to the animals. He didn't send Jesus to the aliens. He didn't send Jesus to Bigfoot. He sent Jesus to humans. And we are the crown jewel. And so often we forget this. I want to invite you to uh, engage in this video just simply called Emmanuel. Now, this video is a modern day telling of the birth of Christ and it shows the value that God has for everyone. Let's enjoy this video together. We were on a journey to find something that couldn't be found. Are you all right, Mary? Yeah. But of course I wasn't. My world was falling apart. I had never felt so alone. When I met Joseph, I thought I had found love. Mary? I felt complete. But I realized something was still missing. And there were others too, searching for hope, beaten down by the trials of this life, feeling the pain. This was utterly impossible. You're pregnant? How did this happen? I already told you. What are you after, Mary? What do you want from me? Joe. Joe. What? It's time. We're not due for another month, Joe! Follow me. And the impossible happened. The God of the universe was born. He was perfect. This was love, that this child would come from heaven to be born to us. And then they came, all of them looking for something different. For some, his hope and provision. For others, his forgiveness and acceptance. 
While I was searching for love, love had found me, a love that all can receive. Emmanuel. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video and got a sense of what that might look like in our culture today, but understand that you matter to God and God values his crown jewel of creation because Jesus with us came to us for us. Now, I know that you're all curious what my favorite uh, Christmas movie is, and actually, it's ironic because this was one of the least favorite movies when I first saw it. Uh, in Christmas of 2003, I was in Detroit, and we all went to, out to a movie uh, over Thanksgiving. It was Thanksgiving, not Christmas. And we went and saw the movie Elf. And I have to tell you, I just didn't get it. I didn't understand it. I didn't think it was funny. I found it annoying. And then all of a sudden, something shifted and I was drawn to it, and I think it's one of the most hilarious Christmas movies of all time. I often quote Elf, um, Buddy the Elf, throughout my day. <laughs> Not often, occasionally. Uh, but I wanted to give you a, a sense of, you know, I feel a little bit like Buddy the Elf uh, sitting on the lap of Bo um, Bob Newhart, uh, in the North Pole when Buddy the Elf is coming to terms with the fact that Bob Newhart is not really his real father. And so, big guy on a little chair, here we go. Just thought that might help put you in the Christmas spirit. Another implication that I want to share with you that the incarnation shows us is that everything is spiritual. This breaks down the sacred secular divide where we compartmentalize every area of my life. Well, I, I have my work life and then I have my church life. And my church life is when I give attention to God and my work life is when I give attention to work. <laughs> and Jesus came with us to be with us in every area of our life. And so we want to let you know that everything is spiritual. Your work is spiritual. Your home is spiritual. When you sleep at night, it can be the most sacred experience of your day. So many of us get tripped up here. I love the way Tish Harrison Warren in her book that I'm going to show you in just a little bit says, she says, when suffering is sharp and profound, I expect and believe that God will meet me in its midst. But in the struggles of my average day, I somehow feel I have the right to be annoyed. Now, when we're annoyed, God's right there with us then as well. The way we interact with the checkout person, uh, the way we interact with the, um, with the customer service agent speaking with a strong foreign accent in another country, that matters. That's a sacred conversation. And sometimes I fail to honor that. But we can do better because everything is spiritual. Uh, the, the, the last, uh, next to the last one I want to share with you about the implication, oh, uh, is this, Jesus gets us. Jesus gets us. Perhaps you notice the ad campaign uh, where they have these great uh, stories and then they just say, so was Jesus. He gets us. Well, the reality is Jesus gets us. Now, I, I want to I maybe expand your thought here a little bit. There is a difference between knowledge and understanding and understanding through that 
And then once you experience something, it's a whole different ball game. So I have college students. Uh, my daughter, uh, my daughter, and my son, all three of them have studied to be teachers. My son is currently studying to be a teacher. Well, he's uh, gonna substitute teach while he's getting his master's over Christmas break, and he's gonna get in a classroom. And teachers can learn everything there is to learn. They can have all the knowledge, but there is nothing like being in the classroom and experiencing teaching from that perspective. It's quite different. Well, let me just maybe stretch your thinking a little bit here. Jesus experienced life in the flesh. He experienced what it was like to wake up. He experienced what it was like for his muscles to ache from strenuous activity. He experienced what it was like to be hungry. And Jesus gets us. He understands it in a deep way as he experienced it. This is not just a head knowledge or a general knowledge or understanding. We understand clearer and deeper when we experience it. So when the scripture says in Hebrews 4.15, for we do not have a high priest who was unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Make no mistake about it, Jesus gets us. And then the last part that I want to mention as far as um, kind of this implication that this incarnation has for us, is that this reaffirms the value of each human being. Jesus came to us and for us, for all of us. Uh, I, I wanna uh, read you another quote from Tish Harrison Warren. Uh, she says, we often understand the Protestant Reformation as a conflict about doctrine. Justification, grace versus works, ecclesiology, and indulgences. And it was. And if all of that is confusing to you, it's okay. <laughs> but what captured the imagination of commoners in Europe during the Reformation was not only the finer points of doctrine, but the earthy notion of vocation. The idea that all good work is holy work. That was revolutionary. The reformers toppled a vocational hierarchy that had placed monks, nuns, and priests at the top of everyone else below. Reformers taught that a farmer may worship God by being a good farmer and that a parent changing diapers could be as near to Jesus as the Pope. This was scandalous. Jesus values everyone. You never lock eyes with someone who does not matter to God. The final section I want to share with you, this final movement of this message, is that Jesus, with us in the everyday, Let's look at the reality of this, how this changes and affects every moment of our day. How do I practice the presence of God in my everyday life? The first way, do the dishes, man. <laughs> Just do the dishes. Uh, uh, my dishwasher has been a catastrophic failure over the holidays so far. Thanksgiving, it wasn't working. I got it working the night before Thanksgiving, so excited. Uh, 10 days later, we noticed all the hard wood in front of our dishwasher was warping at the seams. 
because my dishwasher, unbeknownst to me, had been leaking for 10 days and water had gotten underneath the wood. So I pulled it out, bought a new one, and it sat for a week because I was terrified to install this one that the same thing might happen again. And I kept telling my wife every day, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. Finally, yesterday, we're filming on Thursday, yesterday on Wednesday, I said, okay, I'll get it. At four o'clock, I started to install it. I had to call our small group uh, head, leader of our small groups and say, John, I am not gonna be able to be at small groups tonight because I promised my wife I would get this thing installed. And so install it, I did, and I did the dishes. (laughs) That was a sacred commitment that I made to my wife that I would place her needs above my wants. Trish Harrison Warren, in her book, Liturgy of the Ordinary, Sacred Practices in Everyday Life says, a sign hangs on the wall of a new monastic Christian community house. Everyone wants a revolution. No one wants to do the dishes. Trish says, I was and remain a Christian who longs for revolution, for things to be made new and whole in beautiful and big ways. But what I am slowly seeing is that you can't get to the revolution without learning to do the dishes. The kind of spiritual life and disciplines needed to sustain the Christian life are quiet, repetitive, and ordinary. I often want to skip the boring daily stuff to get to the thrill of an edgy faith, but it's in the dailiness of the Christian faith, the making the bed, the doing the dishes, the praying for our enemies, the reading the Bible, the quiet, the small, that God's transformation takes root and grows. Everyone, I love that quote, everyone wants a revolution. No one wants to do the dishes. You know who did the dishes in the Christmas story? (laughs) Joseph. Joseph carried the water. He put away his pride and did what he was asked to do by God without complaint. And he has largely overlooked and underestimated the power of his example and life. But Joseph, he did the dishes. Uh, The second thing that I want to invite you to do in your everyday life is just simply this. Be attentive to your blessings. Look for them. Notice them. Because when you notice the small blessings, they become enormous places of trust and gratitude toward God. Be attentive to your blessings. Slow down, enjoy, savor, notice. Be attentive to your small blessings. I woke up this morning, (laughs) that's a great thing. But many people wake up, it's like, oh, it's Pittsburgh in the winter time. It's so gloomy. Are you awake? Are you able to breathe? That's enough to ex- <laughs> to have an infinite heart of gratitude for. Guess what? There's weather. There's weather every day. We don't have to get all worked up about the weather. We can just say, God, thank you that there is oxygen in the air that I get to breathe. Thank you for the weather. I know many of us like, oh, the weather, it's coming. The weather, it's coming. Every day, weather's coming, okay? Just take a chill and appreciate God in the midst of every moment of your day. In those mundane moments, God is there. That is where you see the real spirituality in moments. Where do we see the real nature of God? In the simple, in the small. We see it both in the Sermon on the Mount and 
his sermon with a towel, washing his disciples' feet. Joseph is the good guy who will play second fiddle all the time. What he did was huge. He honored the Savior of the world through his own humility. The, the miracles speak loudly. But so do those one-on-one interactions with Jesus because of the care and recognition that he gives to the individual person. Feeding the 5,000 is great, but it doesn't land the same way as the woman who breaks the alabaster jar to anoint Jesus' feet. The disciples, I believe they got to the place where they took Jesus' presence, God with us, for granted. And it lead, led me to kind of wonder this thought. W- would you even notice if Jesus was missing from your life? <laughs> would you notice? Or, or do you live your life so independently, so on your own, that if Jesus wasn't around, you, you wouldn't even notice? May it not be so. I want to invite you to consider a few books, a few resources that will help you better understand how to live an ordinary day with Jesus. Uh, John Ortberg has a study just simply called An Ordinary Day with Jesus. Look into it. As I mentioned, Tish Warren uh, has the Liturgy of the Ordinary, Sacred Practices in Everyday Life. She looks at, you know, God is near in the overlooked moments. How do we embrace the sacred in the ordinary and the ordinary in the sacred? And then finally, Jerry Bridges uh, wrote a book called Practice the Presence of God. Because it is my deepest hope that God's presence, grace, love, goodness, God with us will be with you and noticed by you throughout your day, not just on Sunday morning. God bless you, everybody. I hope you have a great Christmas. I hope you have a great week before Christmas coming up. And it's my prayer that God's presence and love will surround you and impact your life in the normal, ordinary moments of every day. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next week.